Uh, my name is David Bell, uh, and uh, I'm a consultant psychiatrist in psychotherapy at the Tavistock and Portman NHS Trust, where I'm being interviewed today. Uh, I'm also uh, a psychoanalyst, and I'm former president of the British Psychoanalytic Society. At the Tavistock, uh, where I've worked for very many years, um, I um, divide my time between uh, clinical work and supervision. But the, in my clinical role, I run a specialised unit called the Fitzjohn's Unit, which um, provides uh, treatment for the most severe, complex and difficult cases, really. I, I put it that way because I, I prefer not to use a diagnostic label in, um, because diagnostic labels really obscure as much as they uh, reveal. But most of our patients suffer what is technically called personality disorder. That means that they have difficulties that radiate out through all their life uh, and cannot be regarded as discrete sort of illness episodes. And many, most of them have been disturbed for a very long time and a significant number of them uh, suffer from depression. Now I understand that you wanted, to, um, you wanted me to talk uh, principally uh, about depression and how I think about uh, depression, you know, from the perspective which I come from. One of the difficulties that I have straight away I've already alluded to, and that's the difficulty of labels. Labels are helpful, we can't manage without labels, we have to write reports, we have to plan services, but when it comes to the individual, labels are difficult. And if we take the label depression, the more experience I have, the less I think that term tells us about the real nature of an individual suffering. Because it covers such an enormous field that grouping them together is really problematic. So at one end you might have a small discrete episode of something that happens to a person or for reasons that can't be properly understood they become low and depressed for a relatively short period of time and then manage to reconnect with the world. That's entirely different from what perhaps is the majority of the patients that we see in the health service. A lot of those kinds of difficulties are managed locally by local resources, which include one's friends and family, and they also include the general practice and any other resources that are available. But the kind of patients that we often see, or largely see, and I'm not just talking about my service, I'm talking about uh, psychiatric and psychotherapy services in the health service. You just scratch the surface a little and you find the patient has been depressed most of their lives. That is, most of their lives there's been an awareness of something profoundly wrong, but that awareness sometimes kept at a distance, and sometimes they might man individuals might manage life, they might have relationships, they might get jobs, and, and so on. But then something happens, and sometimes it'll be very clear what's happened, at an event like, say, loss of a job, or end of a relationship. Well, it might be less clear. There might be no obvious external trigger, although as you come to understand the person, you can understand, come to understand why the breakdown happened then. But what happens in the breakdown, really, is not so much that the person suddenly gets depressed as if it's um, uh, a sudden episode falling upon them. It's their capacity to hold the depression away has broken down. So that what was, if you like, a hovering shadow that came and went and disabled them, but they managed, now becomes a huge presence dominating their life, infiltrating into everything they do so that they are unable to get on with ordinary life. A significant number of the individuals that we see um, in you know, NHS services um, have had difficulties not only in terms of depression, although the way that they present themselves may be depression, but they may have had all sorts of difficulties all of their lives, for instance, in managing human relationships. Some of them uh, have lived in a very isolated way and not managed relationships. Some of them have been able to work only for short times and so on, but manage something. So there's a sort of gradation into something that's much more global in terms of functioning. Um, and maybe I'll come back to this in a, in, in a moment, but it's important to foreground that first of all, because a lot of the ways that a highly medicalized psychiatry looks at depression is on the model of a medical illness. 
and that's the wrong model. Um, that is, it, the way I sometimes put it, is that the depressive uh, symptom is treated as if it's a medical illness. So, for medicine, you've got, if you get infected with a bacterium, what do you do? You've got an antibiotic. So, in psychiatry, we invented something called, you got the depression, so we get the antidepressives. There is no such thing as an antidepressant because there is no specifiable illness even yet now that we could easily classify as being depression as a medical illness. So there is no depressococcus which the antibiotic, the, the antidepressants can wipe out. But unfortunately that is the model that tends to dominate some of the thinking and of course a lot of that thinking uh, thinks in terms of the cause of depression being a biological change in the brain uh, and after, even up till today that has still not yet been proven and the enormous amount of resources that have gone into trying to prove there's an easily specifiable biological disorder so that depression can be treated as a medical illness is still not discovered. On the other hand there's a lot of things that we do know that you don't need to do a lot of research for we do know that people have been had difficulties in early life, particularly um, psychiatric disorders in a parent, uh, maybe a depressed parent, have experienced early losses in their lives, such as loss of a parent, or have suffered neglect of various sorts. Such individuals are predisposed to suffer from psychiatric disorders, and those disorders include depression. We also know that people who are subjected to major um, traumatic and difficult life events such as uh, losing a job for example or losing a relationship or becoming alienated in various ways this again predisposes to depression and I sometimes wonder if all the huge millions and millions of pounds that have been spent on trying to find the biological cause have been, been, instead been spent on trying to provide um, relatively inexpensive forms of social support uh, especially in early life, that might have been preventative, that that would have been money better spent, or would have been the source of a very good research study as well. Unfortunately, pharmaceutical companies are not minded to fund that kind of research. And there's a considerable amount of literature. I could refer you, for example, to the UCL Critical Psychiatry website, um, run by Dr. Joanna Moncrief, where you can find some of the literature so if you look at the critical psychiatry website, you'll find some of the critical literature on the relation between um, the dominance of a medical paradigm and the funding of, the, uh, of research. Now, I'm not saying, you know, that pharmaceutical companies are all bad people and they're to blame. In a way, they're going about doing their job and they're doing what many of them believe in. It's just, it's just an unfortunate fact of life they've come to dominate a field and they've dominated the thinking in that field. So many, you know, even when I was a, a young psychiatrist, many of our conferences were funded by pharmaceutical companies. So they have a huge reach and they also have, it's an extraordinary thing that when I was um, a young psychiatrist, and a lot of people who admitted with breakdowns suffered what we, what we called mixed anxiety and depressive disorder. That is, they were agitated, anxious, full of dark thoughts, sometimes felt suicidal, didn't know what to do with themselves, couldn't manage, breaking down. And that was a very good diagnosis because it captured the symptomatology of what they suffered from. Then, mysteriously, about two-thirds of the way through my training, it changed to depressive disorder, or clinical depressive disorder, or endogenous depressive disorder. That was roughly the same time as the pharmaceutical companies started to have a very big say in the way that psychiatrists were, begin were thinking about psychiatric disorder. And curiously, the symptoms of this thing called depressive disorder seem to be the same as the symptoms that the antidepressants claim to be able to treat. So this move increased the pressure to treat this depression as some kind of illness episode. And what I'm trying to emphasize is that that's the wrong model. Most cases of depression that we see 
cannot be regarded as events like getting uh, uh, an infectious illness. They are complex and they cannot be treated as things separate from the individual who suffers from them. So the individual is a character, a person, with his own fault lines, as we all have, his own areas of vulnerability, uh, laid down from early in life. Um, and we need to understand the person as a whole. And that's the way we do things in, at the Tavistock and you know, other related um, services where we emphasize a psychotherapeutic approach. Some people think psychotherapy means something very esoteric and it's all to do with probing into your unconscious. It is in a way, but much more important is that the way psychotherapy thinks of things, it, it thinks not as a person having an illness, but the illness has been an expression of that person. And there's value in a sense in the illness because in understanding it, the person will come to understand themselves better. And sometimes people need to have, it sounds paradoxical, a breakdown. I'm not saying a, a massive breakdown, but they need to have some kind of a breakdown in order to come to terms with the way they've been living all their lives in a, a, an isolated way or a cut off way or not able to develop very, very stuck. So we don't necessarily view a breakdown as only negative. It's negative for all the obvious reasons, but it's also sometimes an opportunity to think about things. But if you package it up and say this is an illness that you're suffering and this illness requires biological treatment of the antidepressants, then you lose the opportunity for understanding its meaning for that individual. Now there's always been a tension in psychiatry about these kinds of issues and in some ways I think it's been a healthy tension. That is, if you like, the tension between the more medicalized biological views and the more psychological and social view. And I think as long as that tension is there, though I'm obviously more to one side, that's no bad thing. But what's happened is the medicalized view has come to hegemonize, to really dominate thinking, not only in terms of medical, in terms of giving antidepressants, but medical in terms of the way the illness is conceptualized. That is, it's conceptualized as an event which can be managed as if it were an illness. So that managed might be antidepressants, which I've already explained I don't like the term antidepressants. It might be certain very brief forms of intervention. But they still have this medical, very medicalized model that you have a symptom check, then you have the intervention, then you have the post-intervention check, and if your symptoms have gone down, the, sim the, the intervention has been helpful. Well, it's no different to having an illness having some medical treatment for the illness and then recovering from the illness. And I'm just saying it doesn't work for that. The way um, I tend to think of it is, it, it is that, as I said, there is no such thing as depressive illness in that sense. But if one thinks it's a person, the person is suffering. And anything that can help the suffering is valuable. And certain kinds of antidepressant do help the suffering. The mistake is calling it an antidepressant. What we should call it, and here I'm very much following the lines of Dr. Moncrief from the Critical Psychiatry Group at U University College London, is we shouldn't call them antidepressants, we should call them mood-altering drugs. So then we could say to a patient, I'm you're in pain, terrible pain, we're going to give you a drug that might be helpful in reducing your pain, in the same way that if you had a pain, say from a fracture or something else, we would give you analgesics. But we wouldn't expect the analgesics to heal the fracture but we would expect them to help you. And we would also explain to patients that taking antidepressants um, is problematic because they have side effects, some of which are quite profound and underrepresented often when they're prescribed. And also that no one should take antidepressants for a very long time because um, they cease to have much effect and the effect becomes to some extent that people become dependent on the medication. So one could say, you know, that in order to deal with the pain, one takes some medication, but then one still needs to think about where it's all come from and how one understands it. And that is best done by people who are interested in that and trained to think in this way. They don't necessarily have to be a highly specialised psychoanalyst or psychotherapist. They might be uh, 
social workers, doctors, nurses who are interested in this who are being supervised so that they can come get to know a patient. Another way of putting this is to describe the tension that I'm describing is also between what's called the nomothetic and the ideographic. This refers to when I was studying psychology more years ago than I'd care to, to, to think about, but my introductory textbook started with the paragraph, one of the difficult problems facing psychology is the tension between the nomothetic and ideographic levels of description. And what they meant was this. Nomothetic means putting things into groups. So we put things into groups that have similar features. It might be vegetables. It might be sonata form. It might be Victorian buildings. It might be certain kinds of uh, psychological problems, like depression. And we group them together for, in order to look at what's similar between them, and that helps us develop theories about them, understand the progress of, 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 the, of the difficulties that people are having, and so on. The ideographic refers to the unique qualities of the individual. So what this textbook was saying was, any individual person is a unique object. Uh, now you, you could, uh, and that tension between that individual with their unique narrative of their life and putting them into a group of individuals suffering uh, from various kinds of disorders, there's a tension between those two ways of thinking. And you cannot do without either. If you had no nomothetic, you could have no rational discourse. Because you could never say something like, well, I think people who suffer from very severe depression tend to have difficulties in early life. You couldn't say that. So, of course, you need the nomothetic level. But you also need the ideographic. And I think one of the things that's happened is that the nomothetic has come to completely dominate. And this has led to what I think of uh, as a kind of the industrialization of psychiatry. That is, individuals, instead of being treated as an individual, who has a narrative to their life, and all their symptoms have a meaning, they're treated as a carrier of a disorder. And once they're diagnosed with the disorder, that sets them on a particular care pathway already set up, because people suffering from that disorder get this treatment. And that is paying very little attention to the individual person and also to the quality of the relationship between anyone looking after that person uh, and the consequences that has for their improvement in their mental health. So I think there's been this hegemony of the nomothetic and that's lead, led to a great deterioration of psychiatric care. It does not mean that there's no good psychiatric care, far from it. But it does mean that the various nurses and doctors and psychiatrists who seek to maintain what I would call the humanity in their work, are having to do it at cost and against the pressure upon them to just group people to give together uh, and if they make a diagnosis and there's a pre-programmed uh, uh, treatment pathway that they have to go on.